So uh, just to begin, if, if you don't mind uh, introducing yourself and then we can discuss the article, uh, Marx in Algeria, that you wrote. Yeah. Uh, you know, my own uh, approach to maths uh, and Marxism uh, is deeply shaped by my training in uh, revolutionary operaism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. since uh, the end of uh, the 70s when I was a kid and I started to be politically active. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, of course, many things happened uh, and uh, they influenced also my reading uh, of maths. <laughs> to put it very shortly, I think uh, the encounter with migration in Italy and in Europe uh, was particularly important in this respect because uh, it led me to kind of uh, provincialize the reading of Marx uh, that emerged out of the development of operaism, uh, basically in Italy in the 1960s and 1970s. And then, you know, uh, I engaged uh, in conversations with uh, anti-colonial, post-colonial uh, thinkers in many parts of the world. Uh, and this uh, also played a role, of course. Mm, and maybe I should mention also my work uh, with uh, Brett Nielsen, uh, an Australian mm -hmm. uh, friend and comrade uh, that has been particularly important for me in the last uh, 20 years. You know. mm -hmm. We wrote a couple of books together and uh, Matz figures prominently in both books, the book on uh, borders and in a book on, uh, let's say, contemporary capitalism, although it's a bit uh, generic. Yeah, so to get in, into the article in, in particular, so you discuss a little bit at the beginning that you're not particularly interested in retelling the history of why Marx was in Algiers, but more in how Marx's thoughts emerged in the South and in the East. And you talk about you have a reading particularly of Marx in his, in his later years in 1880 to 1882, changing and sort of interpreting more multilinear, uh, a more, more multilinear approach to the Weltgeschichte um, and his reading of the development of capitalism uh, in historical development. So if you don't mind sort of uh, explaining a little bit more about this interpretation and how it relates, I think you make allusion to the debate about the universal, in particular in post-colonial debates. Uh, so if you would explain a little bit more about it, how it relates and also how it's related to historical development in the colonial situation, his letters to uh, Vera uh, Vasilich in Russia and you know his commentary on Russia too. So any of these subjects, yeah. Yes, of course. I mean, let me start by saying that uh... Uh, Marx in Algiers was published as uh, an article, uh, but actually is the last chapter of a short book uh, I published uh, on Marx. And so it's a kind of attempt to take stock of uh, an analysis uh, of Marx that follows uh, the thread of uh, the problematic of what we call today uh, production of uh, subjectivity. Mm -hmm. And the uh, second uh, uh, introductory remark uh, is that the title uh, is also a kind of a reference uh, to uh, a very important article that was uh, published uh, in the 1960s by Mario Tronti, uh, and that was titled uh, Lenin in England. Uh, that article was particularly important in the development of autonomous Marxism in Italy, and uh, it particularly uh, shaped uh, the uh, operaist view uh, of uh, uh, tendency, a very important notion in Marx and in autonomist uh, Marxism. So that uh, text uh, uh, is uh, an attempt uh, to engage in a critical uh, and in a way self-critical uh, uh, conversation 
with uh, uh, a specific understanding of capitalist uh, development, which is uh, shaped by uh, a certain uh, linearity and by the idea that uh, there is always uh, a most advanced uh, uh, point in the development of capitalism and that most uh, advanced point is the one in which uh, uh, revolution must be uh, played out. That was a, a kind of uh, hypothesis in uh, the mid 1960s that was uh, uh, polemical with respect to third worldism. <laughs> So to put it shortly, while uh, you had a lot of people who said uh, the chance for socialist revolution uh, must be uh, looked for in uh, the third world in places like uh, Algeria or uh, Vietnam, mm, Mario Tronti uh, said that the opposite is true. The real chance for revolution uh, uh, is there where uh, uh, capitalism is most advanced and why? Because uh, the very fact that capitalism is most advanced corresponds to the fact that workers' struggles are uh, uh, very strong, you know, because it is workers' struggles that drives uh, uh, capitalist uh, development. So basically, in uh, my article, I challenge this uh, view, but uh, I do that uh, uh, not in a simple uh, way. Uh, I try to uh, retain something of uh, uh, the uh, operaist uh, paradigm. And this something is the fact that there is a tendency of development uh, in capitalism and uh, that uh, this tendency of uh, development translates uh, in uh, quite different uh, ways onto different material contexts. And so it is from this point of view that uh, I engage in a conversation with many thinkers who have uh, uh, spoken of uh, a multilinear uh, understanding of the history of capitalism, particularly in uh, the late March, but uh, according to some people uh, already in uh, the Grundrisse. Hmm. So from uh, the point of view of this, uh, reading of Marx, uh, uh, I try to uh, reframe a whole set uh, of questions, uh, including uh, the very general question of the universal hmm. and uh, of the relation between uh, uh, abstract and concrete, you know, because uh, uh, to put it uh, quickly, uh, I uh, argue that uh, uh, the translation, the moment of translation of the abstract onto the concrete uh, always implies uh, important uh, mutations uh, with the way in which uh, uh, the abstract, which means uh, uh, the, the, the rule of capital, uh, uh, constructs its own history. So from this point of view, uh, I have uh, in particular a discussion with Deepa Chakrabarti with uh, quite famous chapter of provincializing Europe uh, when it talks uh, where it talks uh, about the two histories uh, of capital and uh, well I think I, I uh, reframe that kind of uh, analytical model in a way that is not uh, necessarily close to the one Chakrabarti had in mind. And uh, I uh, kind of emphasize uh, the moment of clash between uh, these two histories, you know, the one that is uh, shaped by uh, real abstraction as a, a basic code of capital and the one that is shaped by uh, the translation of real uh, abstraction onto uh, different material contexts. Real abstraction 
also means uh, real uh, um, abstract labor. You know? And the concept of abstract labor is kind of uh, central in uh, uh, the short book uh, I wrote and I was uh, mentioning uh, before. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, this uh, reflection upon uh, abstract labor has important implications for the way in which uh, we imagine and construct today uh, the other of capital, you know? <laughs> uh, or uh, if you prefer the revolutionary subject. <laughs> I uh, am convinced that uh, in most uh, Western capitalism, and in particular in autonomous Marxism, there was a tendency to uh, imagine uh, the working class in very abstract terms, you know, uh, as a kind of reversal of the progress of uh, uh, abstraction uh, that is inherent uh, to uh, capital. And I try to uh, uh, introduce uh, the moment of uh, translation, as I was explaining before, also uh, in uh, uh, the understanding of the composition of labor. So that uh, uh, labor, living labor, becomes uh, uh, constitutively uh, characterized by a deep uh, heterogeneity. Uh, crisscrossed uh, by difference, and this raises, of course, uh, important challenges for the way in which uh, uh, we uh, understand uh, the concept of class that is also a stake uh, in, my, in my work. Well, thank you for that. And, and I'm also curious about you frequently reference Marx's use of the term grenze. So you talk about, you know, capital encountering borders and encountering non-capitalist space. So if you could talk a little bit more about that in the construction of the world market. Yes, this is, uh, this is uh, for me, a very important point. And uh, uh, it is also a very important point. I must uh, understood that uh, in the work I do with, uh, with Brett, with Brett Nielsen, uh, we kind of elaborate uh, on uh, a short passage uh, that you find in uh, the Grundrisse, where uh, uh, Marx says, uh, on the one hand, uh, that uh, uh, the constitution of the world market uh, is immediately given uh, with the concept uh, of capital. And on the other hand, the, the moment of uh, the encounter with uh, uh, the limit is uh, constitutive of the operations of capital. And Marx says uh, capital uh, uh, encounters the limits in its development and it turns them onto obstacles to be overcome. So I have uh, very much emphasized uh, this uh, point. Uh, and uh, I have uh, uh, argued that we should uh, take this moment of the encounter uh, with the limit uh, uh, as a moment that generates specific conflicts and uh, uh, antagonism in the history and in the present of uh, capitalism. This is, of course, not uh, uh, that original. Maybe uh, what is uh, peculiar is uh, my emphasis on the fact that uh, the word, the German word that Marx uses for uh, limit, uh, which means grenze, is also uh, the word that denotes uh, geopolitical borders. <laughs> this is uh, maybe. <laughs> a bit original, but, uh, you know, just think of uh, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, uh, her uh, 1913 uh, book on the accumulation of capital, uh, you can find uh, the same conceptual, uh, conceptual angle, you know. And uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I think that uh, this point uh, continues to be particularly important today because it uh, uh, shows that the constitution of the world market is never given. Here, 
there is definitely a difference with uh, with Rosa Luxemburg, you know, because Rosa Luxemburg uh, uh, was convinced that uh, capital uh, needed uh, literal outsides. And once all the world will become capitalist, Rosa Luxemburg says, uh, capitalism will be over. But uh, the this did not happen as uh, we know. And so uh, uh, what I think, uh, uh, what I foreshadow in that piece, but then uh, I elaborated more with Brett in the politics of operations on the point is that we have to reframe the very notion of outside. And we have to take seriously also the fact that capitalism or capital uh, may produce its own outsides, may produce uh, the limits that uh, it then turns on to uh, obstacles uh, to be overcome, because this is a very important moment in the process of valorization, you know. And so we are confronted today with the multiplication of, let's say, quote and unquote, uh, artificial outside. Hmm. And so I think this is, uh, again, uh, important also for uh, the topics that uh, I was uh, mentioning before, because in this moment uh, of, uh, let's say, so metaphorically, encounter with the limit, uh, uh, capital is always confronted with uh, uh, a uh, problem of translation, you know, again, in metaphorical sense, of course, you know. Uh, so on the one hand, you have an abstract structure again, you know, but on the other hand, you have this uh, uh, multiplication of encounters that are also always, uh, at least in a certain sense, clashes. <laughs> Uh, with uh, limits, uh, with outsides. Uh, and this moment uh, of uh, encounter with the limit uh, generates uh, 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 heterogeneity, I mean, if, you, if you understand what I mean with uh, this word. You know. I think it's an important point because uh, mm, the idea that uh, capital uh, is uh, uh, basically a homogenizing power, uh, uh, it's a very widespread idea. You find it, of course, in, uh, in the Manifesto, 1848, but you find it again and again also in contemporary debates, uh, just to think uh, of Vivek uh, Chibat's uh, book uh, uh, on uh, uh, post-colonial studies or subaltern studies. I mean. hmm. So I think there is a need to, 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 to reframe the relation between homogeneity and heterogeneity. And of course, I mean, these are abstract uh, concepts, uh, but it is easy to operationalize them and to make them uh, very, very concrete, uh, particularly as far as the question of uh, the composition of living labor is, uh, is concerned. And this question, you know, is uh, uh, the most important one for me. <laughs> and I, I, I wonder with that, if you don't mind, you referenced the article, of course, Primitive Accumulation, and talk about the relation of this between the universal moments of capital and its heterogeneity. You referenced Marx's letter to the Russian editors, uh, where he says not to draw uh, a generic study from, from a specific moment in Western Europe. So if you can explain more about how it relates for the concept of primitive accumulation. Yes, primitive accumulation is, uh, is a very important question. Uh, in my own uh, work, uh, I wrote a long essay on uh, that topic some 15 years ago that has been a kind of generative essay meaning that uh, it has helped me to frame uh, uh, a whole set uh, of questions. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I mean, your question leads me back to what uh, I was uh, saying before. Uh, it is true that Marx uh, uh, in his uh, late years uh, was uh, kind of uh, revising 
his earlier uh, uh, view of uh, primitive uh, accumulation. Uh, the, the letters uh, and the draft of letters uh, that he wrote uh, in his conversation with the uh, Russian revolutionaries uh, in his last years uh, are uh, symptomatic uh, of that. You know, I'm convinced that uh, uh, there has been a bit of uh, overemphasis on uh, those letters and drafts of letters uh, in the last years, uh, you know, particularly in, uh, in the US uh, uh, debate. Uh, some thinkers uh, in France uh, have come up with uh, uh, an interpretation of Marx as a kind of communitarian thinker that I don't think uh, is uh, uh, particularly consistent. Uh, but above all, uh, you know, I think it is uh, more important to rescue this uh, uh, moment of uh, confusion in the late March. And this uh, will uh, to uh, go beyond his own limits. You know, this is really something that I find powerful. Uh, and at the same time, you don't find a systematic uh, uh, alternative to uh, the picture of primitive accumulation, in particular, that he provided in uh, Capital Volume One. Uh, but uh, this uh, will to go beyond uh, his limits, his own limits, uh, is very important. And he definitely uh, understood that, uh, in a way, his gaze had been provincial. You know. He was looking now uh, well beyond Europe. He always did so, uh, at least uh, since uh, he started uh, to write articles uh, for uh, the New York uh, Daily Tribune, you know, in the early 1850s. But uh, after uh, publishing uh, Capital Volume One, he intensified this kind of awareness of the fact that capital was uh, uh, really, and not only conceptually, a world system. And from this point of view, it was uh, definitely considering other paths, other uh, uh, possibilities of development uh, of capitalism. And Russia, that was uh, very important to Marx in the last years, as uh, we know, uh, provided him uh, with uh, kind of uh, testing field. You know? And uh, the kind of uh, multilinear uh, uh, understanding of history, of the history of capitalism uh, that we were uh, discussing before uh, uh, is uh, again tested <laughs> precisely in his uh, uh, writings on uh, Russia. But consider the fact that Marx, uh, uh, that was already quite, uh, quite old, he was a exhausted, he had a lot of family tragedies, he was sick, and he starts uh, to study Russian, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's something that uh, uh, really strikes me, and uh, I tended to uh, understand that this uh, uh, as uh, uh, part uh, of uh, an attempt to widen his, uh, his gaze. And while he widens his gaze, he sees, of course, things that are not compatible with the kind of uh, 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 framework that uh, he forged in, uh, in Capital Volume One. Hmm. Right, and, and in doing that, you quote from, uh, from Katsky, uh, the, the manuscripts that are posthumously published by Katsky, Theories of Surplus Value, uh, it is only foreign trade, the development of the market to a world market, which causes money to develop into world money and abstract labor into social labor. I wonder if you can speak a little bit more about this transformation in the emergence of the world market from abstract labor into social labor and how that relates to, you were mentioning a, a bit about real abstraction earlier. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, this is a question that, uh, 
leads me again uh, to pick up on uh, something I was uh, already already mentioning because uh, at stake in that quote is precisely the the relation between the abstract and the concrete. Uh, let me put it in this. Uh, uh, philosophically very simple uh, uh, way. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the world market, uh, this is a point I discussed with, with many friends, uh, in Mars uh, is uh, a full-fledged concept. <laughs> You know, it's not only uh, the uh, geographical framework of uh, uh, the development of capitalism. It is really a concept. And that quote uh, is uh, particularly relevant from this point of view, because uh, uh, in a way, in that quote, you can uh, uh, imagine that uh, the uh, world market uh, works uh, like an abstract matrix. <laughs> and so on the one hand, you have uh, this kind of abstract uh, matrix that can only exist at the level of the world market. On the other hand, you have uh, uh, the empirical, <laughs> Uh, quote and unquote empirical uh, organization articulation of uh, the world market that of course uh, differs uh, also profoundly i mean from <laughs> uh, conjuncture to conjuncture but i think it is important to make this uh, distinction you know if you uh, think of uh, uh, the theory of uh, the hegemonic cycle uh, developed by what system theory scholars like Emmanuel Wallerstein and in particular Giovanni Arrighi, I mean, you can say that that theory is located at the level of uh, the uh, concrete articulation and organization of the world market. While uh, the world market as an abstract uh, uh, matrix uh, continues to work, uh, in a way crosses <laughs> the history of uh, uh, capitalism. And among other things, uh, uh, allows uh, the continuous translation of uh, abstract labor onto social labor. What does it mean? Of course, abstract labor has a specific meaning uh, in maths. <laughs> It is, uh, to put it uh, with uh, Deepesh Chakrabarti, uh, the way in which uh, uh, capital uh, compels us to see the world. It is uh, uh, more uh, uh, concretely uh, the uh, commodity form that is inscribed onto uh, living labor. Or labor power. They are not the same, but uh, uh, so uh, in order uh, to make this inscription possible, uh, you need uh, again a process that uh, uh, I call translation, I mean, and I hope uh, you understand what I mean. This process of translation does not happen in the same way. Uh, everywhere in the world. And even, you know, in a single city, it happens in very difficult, different uh, uh, ways. So what Marx says, uh, uh, what Marx suggests in that quote is that this uh, uh, process of uh, uh, translation that takes place every day uh, in every city in the world, in every place in the world, uh, is made possible by the world market. <laughs> By the world market uh, is a kind of uh, matrix, as uh, I was saying. And the same uh, is true for money. So, you know, the, the two uh, peculiar commodities that Marx uh, uh, describes in his work, uh, labor power and uh, money, are uh, uh, predicated upon the working of uh, the uh, 
world market. This is the way in which I understand the world market as a concept. And it may sound abstract, but uh, uh, if you follow me, then uh, you are compelled to uh, uh, take seriously the element of heterogeneity that uh, deserves uh, detailed investigation uh, in not an abstract way. Right, and, and from this, I, I'm curious to examine a little bit further the political conclusions you take from this. So you were mentioning earlier Mario Chanti and, and Lenin in England. And to what extent do you think you're, you're still asserting a level of uh, agreement with, with Upper um, but at the same time criticizing some aspects of it that may be focused on, on a working class in, in Europe, perhaps, um, and, and in this, you seek to perhaps like include the global South to an extent within the revolutionary potential throughout the world. Oh, yes, of course. I mean, over the last 20 years, uh, I've been uh, traveling and working uh, with uh, friends and comrades uh, based uh, in many parts of the so-called uh, global South, particularly in India and in Latin America. Mm -hmm. So I am uh, definitely aware uh, of uh, the potentialities uh, that uh, uh, nowadays uh, uh, we can find and could also, we could always find uh, in the so-called uh, uh, global south. You know, to put it shortly, uh, in the, the attempt uh, uh, I have been making uh, over the last years, uh, and the attempt uh, I am making also today uh, in front of the world, you know, is uh, uh, to work toward uh, a new internationalism, a completely new internationalism. Completely new, first of all, because uh, it cannot take uh, as its constitutive uh, basis uh, the nation. While, uh, of course, in uh, the history of socialist and communist internationalism, the nation was the organizational uh, basis uh, of the international. You know? uh, and uh, my idea, uh, but we would uh, need more time to uh, expand on that, is that uh, we really need today um, a new political discourse uh, capable of uh, uh, giving expression to the reality of uh, exploitation and to desires for uh, liberation uh, that exist in many parts of the world, uh, while at the same time, keeping open a space for the political expression of differences, of differences, you know, and needless to say, such a, such a political discourse, such a political horizon, such a, uh, a political uh, imagination can only be a collective work, you know, and, uh, but to think of uh, the situation today in, uh, in in Europe, in the world, uh, uh, with the war in Ukraine. You know, I was, uh, I was doing a, a kind of round table yesterday uh, with Indian friends uh, in, in Calcutta. Uh, and we were talking about uh, uh, Zimmerwald, the Zimmerwald conference in 1815. And we were trying, you know, because there are many people who say, let's organize a new Zimmerwald. Okay, let's do that, but uh, it is not particularly easy, you know. <laughs> At that time, there were organizations. <laughs> there was uh, the labor movement, although divided, uh, etc. Today, everything is more uh, elusive, uh, scattered, uh, you know. <laughs> but at least we were starting uh, to speak about how such a conference uh, should uh, look like uh, today. <laughs> So it is this uh, kind of uh, debates and discussions that we need to intensify 
And at, and at the same time, we also need, uh, let's say, exemplary actions, mm -hmm. which means uh, political experiments capable to be generalized, appropriated, translated again. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel a kind of uh, sense of urgency mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm particularly in front of the world, but uh, I already uh, felt such a sense also uh, in front of uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. So in this, right. in this process, uh, there are no, you know, there is not uh, the possibility that uh, European uh, thinkers uh, or even organizations take the lead. You know, such a, such a process must must be an open process. Uh, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think of the legacy of uh, anti-colonial uh, struggles as one of the driving forces of uh, of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and and I definitely agree with you. And this would be sort of my last question, and it can be a quite, I guess quite a short one, but. And it is quite complicated, but to think you write consistently in this article and in a lot of your work about how borders are changing as well, in particular, you just mentioned the nation state as, as an idea for organizing has been sort of superseded. And in this, you're tracking how capital itself, as many people are aware of, is eliminating borders and superseding them and moving past them. And I would just ask in, in concluding your prediction of where you think this process is heading with the creation of, of supranational bodies that include multiple capitalist countries within them, uh, to think of something like the European Union, for example, you know, where do you see this heading in the in the progression of capitalism and its development? Uh, if this is a universal thing or if this is simply limited to European capitalist development? You know, it, you are aware of the fact that the question is not uh, uh, an easy one. Mm. For sure, like, it's, it's I quite don't like predictions one. because, you know, predictions uh, tend uh, to uh, be uh, denied by facts. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I can say something, of course. Uh, First point is that uh, uh, in, uh, in my work with Brett, uh, we, uh, particularly in Borderless Method, the, the first book we wrote together, uh, we uh, try to uh, problematize a bit the idea that uh, uh, capital supersedes uh, uh, borders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We look at uh, the ways in which capital transforms borders uh, and uh, uh, in a way uh, establishes also new uh, borders uh, while uh, it uh, uh, uses uh, existing borders. I think that today uh, an important uh, question both for research and for politics uh, is uh, uh, precisely the kind of uh, relationship and the kind of tensions between, uh, let's put it uh, in an easy way, political uh, uh, borders and uh, uh, borders that are created by capital, mm -hmm. between political spaces and spaces of uh, capital. Mm -hmm. Second uh, point, Mm, I was mentioning before uh, scholars like uh, uh, Giovanni Righi and uh, uh, Emmanuel Wallace. And I remember when uh, uh, they started uh, to speak about uh, a crisis of the US hegemony mm, at the global level. Mm. Mm -hmm. It was in the early 1990s. Mm. And to be honest, uh, I told uh, they are funny guys. <laughs> they, <laughs> they don't read the newspapers. And so on. Uh, some 10, 15 years uh, after, uh, I had to change my mind. I changed my mind, you know, and uh, I took very, I started to take very seriously this, uh, this idea. And uh, uh, 
particularly after the, the, the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, uh, uh, I started to uh, reorient also my way to look uh, at globalization following this hypothesis. And I would say that also the current war in Ukraine has uh, this uh, uh, kind of relative decline, you know, as uh, uh, its uh, background. <laughs> uh, so in the last years, um, again, also working with, uh, with Brett, uh, we started to test the possibility of uh, or a reorganization of, uh, uh, let's say, the world order or the world market uh, around uh, uh, regional blocks, regional and continental blocks. Uh, I think the war, the current war, uh, in a way, uh, confirms this uh, scenario and it complicates it uh, uh, quite uh, uh, seriously. To be honest, I have no problem <laughs> to say that, uh, I never took seriously Russia in the last uh, 15 years. What does it mean? It means that I never studied uh, Russia. Uh, I was uh, I was convinced uh, that Russia uh, was not going to play a real important uh, role uh, in the reorganization of the world market. You know, and uh, I don't know if you take the book by the last book by uh, Giovanni Arrighi, Alan uh, Smith in Beijing, which is a great book, I think. Uh, well, it doesn't speak of Russia either. You know. So uh, it was quite widespread. Uh, now we are confronted with, uh, with this war, uh, you know, that uh, uh, immediately raises the question of the world order. It's clear, you know, that's, that's the real question. Okay, Europe, okay, Ukraine, Europe, but the scale of uh, uh, the war, at least the scale of the implications of the war is global. You know? And uh, so we'll have to, to, to follow. I'm trying to write on, on the war. I try to, to recuperate a bit my ignorance uh, about, uh, about Russia. Uh, but uh, uh, OK, I, I could say that uh, uh, there are different scenarios uh, today, you know, that uh, the relation between Russia and China is, of course, uh, crucial. Uh, you know, but uh, there is a need uh, to study, as uh, Lenin was saying uh, after the revolution, <laughs> after the October revolution. <laughs> so maybe next time <laughs> we can talk about uh, this question in a more uh, serious way. Well, absolutely. And, and there's so much to be learned, as you said. Uh, and I would love to speak again sometime. I'll, I'll email you yeah, back yeah, and yeah. perhaps we can chat more about it. Great. Well, thank you so much. Maybe hey, a couple really of times to Cornell, maybe in the future. OK, maybe excellent. Again. Yeah. If you're ever here, just let us know. We'll, we'll, have, you, we'll have you speak for sure. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so okay. much. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Ciao. Bye.